There we are. We're live. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in on this first Thursday. Um, I'm Wilder Schmaltz. I'm the Associate Director uh, here at Froelich Gallery. And I'm here with Sarah Horowitz and Benny Fountain, uh, who both have new uh, solo shows opening this week. Um, I, hi, how are y'all? Welcome. Um, I'd uh, also like to say hello uh, from Charles Froelich, the gallery owner. He's doing some of the behind the scenes uh, tech this evening, and also from Kathy Denning, our registrar, and Stacy Fletcher, our bookkeeper, and Kyle Miller, our preparator. And uh, they're all off camera today, except for uh, the three of us. Um, it, it It's uh, an interesting anniversary here. It, it was on April 1st of last year that we did our first of these uh, live broadcasts, uh, first Thursday without most of the in-person first Thursday things that we were all so used to. Uh, that was with Yoshihiro Kitai and Tom Prochaska. Um, and uh, we really appreciate all of our artists and uh, clients and friends who have come along with us in this uh, different way of recognizing the work that our artists do and uh, of being in our community in a different sort of way. And before we begin, um, it's important to acknowledge our presence on stolen and unceded land where Multnomah, Malala, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Kalapuya, Tumwater, Wasco, and bands of Chinook and peoples traditionally lived, uh, which is today home to a thriving multi-tribal community representing hundreds of nations from all over. And so Sarah Horowitz and Benny Fountain each have slideshows of their work that they'll be sharing. And uh, I'll introduce them in turn. Uh, and everyone, if you have questions uh, for the artists, you can type them into the chat and uh, we'll get to them over the course of the hour. Uh, we're going to go until about 6.30 this evening. Um, and we'll just sort of let it flow and, uh, and welcome your questions and comments uh, for the most part within limits. Uh, so let's see, I, I think uh, Sarah, uh, the coin flip indicated that you're going to go first. All right. So if you don't go mind, I'll it. just uh, give a little uh, little uh, blurb about about you. And please okay. feel free to correct as as I go along here. So uh, Sarah Horowitz, uh, the native of Los Angeles, and now she lives and works in Leavenworth, Washington. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree at Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass. Uh, previously. She lived in Portland, Oregon for 14 years, uh, where she was a member of Atelier Mars Printmaking Workshop uh, with Tom Prochaska, the aforementioned uh, mentor to many, many uh, artists and printmakers. Um, and let's see, uh, Sarah taught printmaking at Portland State University for a time. And in addition to her prints and drawings, uh, Sarah produces hand-printed and bound artist books uh, under her imprint Visa Druk. Uh, and Sarah attended residencies at uh, Oak Spring Garden Foundation in Upperville, Virginia, and uh, Art Belvald in Belvald, Switzerland uh, in recent years. And Sarah's prints and books are in public and private collections throughout the world, including the Library of Congress, the Portland Art Museum, Stanford University, Green Library, the New York Public Library, Wesleyan University, and Yale University's Beinecke Library. And since 2013, uh, Sarah has been producing unique hand-bound books uh, for the recipients of the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize presented annually by Yale University. And Sarah, um, all these accomplishments, perhaps uh, you might say that, I don't know if, if you were starting out as an employee of Froelich Gallery some 20 years ago, um, yeah. Might have been a jumping off point of sorts, but uh, we're so glad that that we've had this long relationship with you. Uh, absolutely. I can't believe that it's been that long. And I very much uh, began my foundations in Portland at Frola Gallery, working as the gallery assistant. I labeled slides, if wow. you guys remember slides. <laughs> They're still around somewhere. Oh, yes. I still have them. Uh, so I put together some images 
that will give you a behind the scenes look of the work I did for the show. Um, we can definitely go through the finished work, uh, but I thought it would be interesting to give some sense of my in process work. Um, yeah. I'm in my studio now. So behind me, you can see my shelves, the ink and brayers, that kind of thing. Um, but it's a small studio, so it's hard to literally get everything out and do it a tour. So I put together these images. Let me pull them up for you. And whoops, let's see. Okay, now we're back at the beginning. Uh, so this is a little clip of one of the woodcuts in the show, a detail of the woodcut. Um, but here we are in my studio. And uh, this is the entire studio. It's primarily a printmaking studio. It's outside my house. So uh, in these pandemic times, it's been very helpful to be right near home uh, and not have to travel or share the space with anybody. I've been fortunate in that all the projects I do that incorporate other people. Turns out we all work by ourselves in our own studio. So I've been able to work with book binders, paper makers, printers, um, without a lot of pause in the process, since we're all working on our own already. Uh, in the back, you saw my press. This is a nicer, bigger picture of my press. It's a Charles Brand etching press that I'm very happy and excited about. It actually belonged to Leonard Baskin uh, since 1969 when it was new and was his etching press that he printed and his apprentices or assistants printed his artist books on in his studio. Um, now it still feels a little bit like his and that I'm borrowing it, but it's a workhorse and it's made everything possible. Amazing. So uh, in the show that's up at Fuller Gallery and which I look forward to visiting at the beginning of May and seeing in person, um, I have four woodcuts and six large drawings. The woodcuts are on these uh, panels. They're on Sheena plywood which is a Japanese plywood specifically for wood cutting. It doesn't have a lot of grain, so it's very easy to cut. It's almost buttery, one would say. Uh, and so since I'm doing a lot of detail work and a lot of linear work, I do pay attention to which direction the grain is going when I draw out the image and the way I cut the panel. Uh, but it's not as important as it would be with something like a pine plywood block or even cherry uh, because it's just so soft with not a lot of pull in any direction. Um, you can see the surface layer is a light color and then the next layer underneath is dark. So my usual process is actually to stain a woodcut block before I cut it because then you can see the lighter wood beneath that you've, you've cut away the stain. However, since this is just a uh, couple millimeters thick, this top layer, I kind of have the reverse effect going. So this is in process. I took a lot of pictures as I was going along. I think you can see my cursor. Um, so this came obviously a lot earlier. And then this is later as you can see the various parts unfolding. I kind of leave the really challenging parts to last, these really dense overlapping areas. Uh, I get a lot of my supplies from McLean's printmaking. They import Japanese tools and Japanese materials. So uh, you can see some of my woodcut tools here, sharpening uh, materials. And actually people say, what if you make a mistake? What if you cut through something? Right back here, that's my glue. So when I do cut off something important, and I decide I can't work it into the idea of the woodcut um, or into the image, or I can't actually remove that whole piece of pine or something, I glue pieces back in. And I think um, that process of working with whatever happens is important to the actual work. Um, also the process of mistakes 
and things being imperfect because plants are imperfect, we are imperfect, and it's just finding a balance and a harmony with that and also a sort of a forgiving process as you go along because I'm not a machine and nor would I really want these pieces to look that way. Uh, these blocks are 29 inches high by 18 inches wide. So they're about this big. I think you can see me and I can't see you. So they're pretty big. Um, and all three of the blocks are the same size. One of the pine blocks ended up being smaller because of how I drew it. So that one is the same height, but it's narrower. And here you can see that same block is fully inked. There's a lot of uh, extra ink that goes down on the block as you use the brayer and roll the ink over it uh, around the cutout part. And some, it's called pickup, what we call pickup is acceptable and is very much part of the process. So sometimes you'll see little bits of blue, almost looks smudgy or the imprint of the wood around the pine needles on the print. And that's part of the process of a woodcut. A lot of times you see that in a woodcut, little tool marks and that kind of thing. And that's kind of a telltale sign for a printmaker looking at a printing. how they do that? Uh, the pickup is very much part of it. But I didn't want big halos as you see around the needles. So I actually, since I'm hand printing these needles, I rub it with a wooden spoon from the back of the paper. Um, I wipe off a lot of that ink so that it doesn't inadvertently lift onto the paper. Here's another block. This is the, uh, the seed head block and the block is longer. I just had this photo of the in-process carving. And then on the other side, you see the block right after I printed it. So same kind of thing. Um, I've never made a wood block of these seed heads, but I've had them in my studio. I was drawing them as part of the drawings and it was very, they were so intriguing to me. I had to try and carve a block. I was interested very much in these vertical lines that are part of the structure of the seed heads. And then these more feathery little fronds of, I guess, leaves around them. Um, so I wanted to capture that, also that elegant delicateness. But with a woodcut, obviously, again, it's hard because you can't make things too thin, too barely there, but uh, you can still capture a feeling. And so I wanted that balance between it being a woodcut and being something that is slightly more coarse, slightly more chunky and textured, unlike a etching, which you can get the tiniest of lines, but also then getting that feeling. Right, See? and and Sarah, when you see these mm -hmm. these uh, woodcuts in person, the uh, the carved line is is so similar to your drawn sumi ink line in the mm -hmm. other works of the show. It's really quite remarkable. It's really a feat. Uh, I'm glad. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, well, oh, you sorry. know, and I, I am drawing them on the block, as you can see my pencil lines. Yes. But so it's very much about the gesture of how I draw, and then how I cut and how I make a mark. Um, but it is really tricky to get that to actually translate once you're cutting it, because uh, it has a mind of its own, it wants to do its own thing. And you're trying to carve these and they it doesn't always translate. Um, so in this case, I'm very happy with how they worked out. The paper is called Kaji Natural. I get my paper from Hiromi International, which is in California. And this is a particularly exceptional uh, Kozo paper. It's a mulberry fiber and it prints beautifully. I've printed ettings on it as well as woodcuts. It's slightly translucent. Uh, it's delicate and has beautiful grain, but also is extremely sturdy. Japanese fibers tend to have a longer grain um, to them. So that's what makes them very strong. Um, and then the other just 
quick thing to note is that I'm using a, a blue ink, which I fall in love with. It's called Prussian blue. And I did use it in all those woodcuts and it relates a lot to this, to the drawings I'm doing at the same time. And has been a color that I've been exploring for a while, also in some of my art books, which we'll touch on later and other work I've been doing. So it keeps coming back to the recurring theme and something I'm interested in both on a level that has an emotional content as well as uh, the color itself and from a formal point of view of how it works, for example, here with the white ink and the pines and the contrast. Um, so on one side, you can see the finished drawing, which is the professionally photographed image. But I wanted to give a little glimpse. I'm sitting at this table, but it's three feet wide and these drawings are 30 inches wide by 55 inches long. And so I have to work sideways. I frequently sit at the bottom end and then I scooch the paper down off the end so that I can reach the top of the paper. Or else I come along the side and work sitting sideways basically. You can see uh, some of the pine branches. They're all ponderosa pines. And they are very much a part of the characteristic of where I live. So Leavenworth, Washington is on the east side of the Cascade Mountains. So it's a lot like Bend, Oregon, uh, or any, that whole stretch of Cascadia on the east side of the Cascades, which is a lot drier, somewhat alpine, high desert, um, ponderosa pines, vine maple, lots of wildflowers, wild roses, that kind of thing. So the ponderosa pines give this place uh, its feel, its sense of place, which think of plants as like the fingerprints for a place because they are what responds to the weather, to human intervention, to the terrain, to the soil. And uh, in the summer, you get this hot, warm, piney smell that comes from the pines that makes you feel like you're in this place. And then in the winter, you get that glimmer of the, like, the early dawn light, that pale blue or the evening light uh, when everything's snowy and reflecting. We get a lot of snow. Sometimes this winter we've had three feet for the bulk of the time. <laughs> um, so there is a lot of contrast in what I'm seeing. Uh, there's also this shininess to things. It's sort of a, a glittery sparkliness. But uh, the pines are one of the native plants that really make this area what it is and that I've been gravitating to, towards partially because of their, how they drape, how they feel, uh, the aspect of where we live, but also all these little lines um, and their texture, the texture of the bark, and getting into absorbing that, focusing on that, and uh, is almost a meditative process of learning about the pines, and then also figuring out how to convey this on this surface, and finding a composition, playing with balance, playing with texture, that kind of thing. You can see my very um, official stand pine support structure, which is also known as spray bottles and ink bottles. <laughs> um, that holds up my paper and my materials. Uh, this is another one of the pieces in the show. This is again the seed heads. And I played a lot with blue on blue, white on blue, the reverse uh, blue on white and that kind of thing. So here I'm working with a slightly, uh, with a blue ink that's called Salix Blue. The other uh, one was a Sumi ink because it's very, very opaque and white is hard to get to read to really show up. Uh, this is the seed head. You can see I even have one of them down on the paper to show what I'm working with. And this is in progress because you can see here, this isn't complete. And there ended up being a lot more stems and leafy bits in between. 
you can see the plants at the end and I end up using tape to hold them in position quite a bit. <laughs> uh, um, Sarah, we have a, a question really. Uh, yeah. We hear, uh, uh, did you say that you have uh, works at Baylor University? Did that, did that come up? Um, I don't, I think I do. I'd have to look yeah. at my list. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll cross-reference that. I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, Benny found this uh, uh, on faculty okay. at Baylor. So I think we've got Baylor people in here. Who are nice. Yeah. Um, they, you know, universities have amazing libraries. A lot of them have special collections, rare book collections. Um, so there's a very good chance that I have artist books in their library collection, if not uh, drawings or prints. Um, speaking of ice books, should we move on? Let's. Uh, so this is my most recent artist book. I work with a concept or an idea that I want to create a book from. In this case, it was my grandparents' shell collection. And uh, I, so it's called Contalorum or Concalorum. I haven't found the official pronunciation in all my research, but I actually found an essay by Edgar Allan Poe. He, before he was a well-known novelist, uh, short story writer, he actually wrote an essay on why contology, and back then it was contology, and so the study of shells, rather than the study of mollusks, which incorporate the creature in them, why that was an essential part of understanding natural history and our roots on this earth. Um, so it's actually an essay that he wrote for a scientific book of shells and was asked to write at the time. Uh, it's a series of etchings. So these etchings are based on the shells I have in the collection I received from my grandparents. And so this is both an interest in this specific collection, making etchings of shells, but then also on the process of collecting. They collected. And uh, this also taps into our Western history of collecting. For example, uh, Great Britain, the Netherlands as they colonized areas, sailed across the ocean, especially in the 1800s, 16th or 1800s. They collected things, mosses, orchids, especially natural history objects from the tropical areas because they just felt that they could take whatever they wanted uh, that was up for grabs. And so people built collections called cabinets of curiosities where they had bones and plants and all kinds of things. So uh, from a scientific point of view, it was very interesting. It gave people insight to different parts of the world. It also has the darker side of being about uh, that idea that everything is everything belongs to us. We can take whatever we want. That the natural world and this world of other indigenous peoples who lived in these places did not have a say over that. Right. And it ties right in with the colonial history. Um, this is one of the etchings, all variable sizes, and it's pretty small. So I just wanted to show you an etching plate. I work on a copper plate that has a wax coating and I literally make little scratches in this wax coating, which then get eaten away by an etching chemical. Um, it used to be acid and I use less toxic materials now. So what you see in this picture is the metal plate with the little teeny grooves in it. You can get tiny dots, thumbprints even. And I am smearing ink into the grooves. And then over here, I'm wiping it all off. So it seems a little counterintuitive, but what you get is this plate with ink in these little grooves. And then you run it through the etching press. You can see the dark ink still in there. But most of it has lifted out onto the damp paper that's pressed through the press. And you can see that it mirrors, that reverses. So that is a very quick explanation of etching. Great. Uh, this is a book More concise that... than many I've heard. That's great. <laughs> I'm so glad. I want to give Benny time to talk here too. Um, 
this is a book that you guys have in the gallery, Wildflowers. And yes. this was inspired when I moved to Leavenworth because the wildflowers were off the hook. They were phenomenal. And it turns out we have a particularly special area that's of an incubator for flower and fauna, uh, especially because of the way that this valley was protected during Ice Age times. So it goes all the way back uh, and it was specially sort of a special home for flora, fauna, and native people. So this book, Wildflowers, uh, I worked with an essay by a Washington poet, is the native plants, native flowers from my area. Um, the gallery has a copy of this book there, and also several etchings. So when I do an artist book, which it maybe has 40 copies at the most and is frequently purchased by collections, although also by private collectors. It's so much work and it's such a huge body of work that I usually print a second set of images, uh, addition of five usually of the etchings because not everybody wants a book on their shelf that they have to take down and look at. Some people want to just be able to have a part of that and so primarily creating a couple different editions just meets different collecting interests of of people interested in these. So these are all hand colored etchings with watercolors. Uh, and then just to wrap up, you mentioned the artist residencies. Mm -hmm. This is Switzerland. I started making large landscapes up in high places on top of mountains, where I took chairlifts or hiked, uh, some of them I could drive to. But I literally put the paper down on rocks and heather and drew a pie. This is that drawing and it's about nine feet wide by three feet high. Amazing. And that's Belvald, Switzerland, and it's looking down the valley uh, from the high point down the Rhone River Valley. Uh, I do take in the studio at the end to develop. And then this is a recent uh, residency I did up in the Metau. We, it ended up being in October, we had to push it because of COVID, uh, but we're able to make accommodations so that we were actually able to go do it. And I spent time drawing outside and I, got a kick out of the actual documentation of this process of making these large drawings. So here I am at, up at Washington Pass working on these large drawings. I'm using a pen. It's this pen here. Um, it's called a folded nib pen. And it usually takes a whole bottle of ink to make one of these drawings. So I work very quickly because I only have a few hours due to weather and changing conditions. Get as much of it down on the paper and then finish it, um, mostly just expand the contrast and the darks in the studio. So uh, that was one of my projects from this fall. And then I dove into working on the show that you now see up at Frolic. Yeah, fantastic, Sarah. This is wonderful. Come back, there we go. Do you see me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we, yes, and we've got a, another question here uh, from Mackenzie is asking, what inspired you to draw on site? Uh, I think the landscape. So when I was in Switzerland, the, the access to high elevation was very easy. So you hopped on a chairlift and could get up to 8,000 feet in 10 minutes. And it was just so spectacular. So uh, being able to, you know, most of the time you don't actually have that kind of accessibility or might take you all day to get somewhere, but having that kind of access and the stunning view provoked a lot of thought for me. It gave me the sense of time, a sense of being able to see so far in the distance. So capturing a point in time, but also seeing the landscape as passage through time. Uh, and looking back, the Rhone Valley, you know, had the Romans through it, um, all kinds of invading forces. This is 
part of Switzerland, so it's had various um, um, farms and other types of cultivation throughout it. And so you can see a lot of the remains and the remains of different people throughout the area. And so the idea of drawing on site, capturing the landscape, felt like a way into that history. Right. Fantastic. I so. actually don't draw on site very much for yeah. Yeah. my plant drawings because they take so long. Right. Yes. And this past, this uh, current show was all uh, made during, during the snowy, <laughs> snowy time. In winter. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was cold. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wonderful, Sarah. Um, uh, we'll we'll come back to you. We're going to talk to Benny Fountain now, and then we'll uh, we'll bring all of us back after that for a little more discussion and some more some more questions and answers and all of that. So, hi, welcome back, Benny. Thank you. All right, great. I'll just do a little intro uh, for you, and then I'll let you take it away. Sounds good. Yes, great. So, uh, Benny Fountain was born in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, he received his BFA from Pacific Northwest College of Art in 2005 and his uh, MFA from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia in 2008, uh, during which time he also studied in Rome, Italy. Um, and he's currently associate or uh, professor of, uh, of uh, this this may need to be updated, actually, Benny. Uh, Associate Professor of Studio Art. Oh, that's right. At Baylor. That's still, that's still correct. Great. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, great. great. Uh, at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Uh, and uh, Benny is a recipient of the Jack Kent Cook Foundation Scholarship and a Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation Residency. Uh, his work has been featured in numerous national and international venues such as the Royal Scottish Academy of Art, where he was awarded the Meyer Oppenheim Prize, the Drawing Center, the Bowery, the First Street Gallery in New York, and the Redo Contemporary Art Center in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, in 2014, uh, Benny conducted an on-site composition and color study uh, uh, project uh, with uh, the works of Piero della Francesca in uh, Arezzo, and San Sepulcro, Italy. Uh, and Benny uh, spends his summers uh, in Idaho painting the landscape uh, in uh, the area where he grew up. And Benny, uh, you joined Froelich Gallery in 2011, I believe. And uh, we, we'd had some of your works in, in uh, kind of, uh, group shows prior to that. And people really responded to your work. And uh, it's, it's just been, um, Pretty irresistible. To people. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to show, and I'm really happy to be uh, back to another exhibit. Uh, definitely a bright, a bright spot in uh, this year. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Well. Okay, shall I go ahead and uh, share my screen and pull up my PowerPoint? Please do. Okay, so I've pulled up my slides and um, I can't see anyone's comments or anything, but I'm just seeing my own work right now. So uh, Wilder, if I get to going on too long, just give me a little heads up. I will rein you in, Benny, thanks. Because <laughs> I'm so talkative. <laughs> um, I just uh, am remembering that, um, so you said I started showing at the gallery in uh, 2011 and it was in 2012 that I realized I showed my work alongside Sarah so that was with a show called Kitchen Paintings and uh, this is a return of sorts to Kitchen Paintings. Um, I also um, I really like uh, our, our two show titles together. Sarah's is, is blue and mine is rest. These two words uh, go quite sympathetically together, I think. Absolutely. And this actually looks, this, this blue painting we're starting off with, looks like it could be derived from something like a Prussian blue. Um, I have 
Uh, two, two main ideas I, I'm going to try to weave throughout uh, these slides that I show you all. Um, one is the idea of the layers that go into a brush mark, the layers of time and meaning and memory. And another key idea is this idea of rest that's running through this work and why I titled the show Rest. Uh, to start off with, I'm going to read a quote from a uh, French architect named Fernand Pouillon, and it goes like this. Every artist at work has his leads, his brush, his engraver, something that links his movement not only to his mind, but also to his memory. The stroke that seems spontaneous is 10, 30 years old. In art, knowledge, labor, and patience are everything. And what may appear in a moment has been years on the way. Um, this, is a, this painting was made very quickly. I think it, took, it was made in 20 minutes. And, um, but I, I just am thinking about, though, uh, the type of color study that goes into this. So I made the paintings in 20, minute, 20 minutes, but going into those 20 minutes, I had a, a clear color idea and probably a color idea that uh, was adopted from or borrowed from uh, Joseph Albers. And there, I guess, above is my uh, tribute to his homage to the square with the square window. And I'll talk more about this idea of the layers that go into a painting is showing some examples. But first, let me move to this idea of rest. This painting is called Scones. And these were scones that my wife, Sabrina, baked one morning. And um, I, I, I want to note that, you know, what captured me about this was just the, the beauty and wonder of this visual experience. And I think that this idea of rest is what, what I'm thinking about is that in these paintings and in this painting, for example, there is no, there's no implication in the work of a to-do list of tasks that have to be done or a certain kind of anxiety that's, I think, normal as I start the day. Um, and a lot of these paintings, I was able to see something that was uh, beautiful and interesting because of a state that I was in, or maybe even the, the visual reality that I was seeing had such um, vitality and interest that it shook me out of my anxiety into a state of rest to look and enjoy. In the evenings, it seems like rest is increased. This is a painting uh, titled Apple Pie, and uh, there's the pie and it's eaten mostly, and another plate, I guess an empty plate. And at this point, Again, no to-do list. I guess the only to-do list implied would be, uh, the thing to do would be to eat the pie. And uh, I've, I've already finished doing that. So um, I guess I'm in a state of rest here. Great. Now, this painting is called um, Midnight Tea. I love working at night after everyone's gone to bed. Um, so one thing I love about these starting about 10.30 or no more like 11 o'clock is when you're up at that time, um, there's no expectation that I'm accomplishing anything with my life <laughs> or that, I, that I'm getting uh, something fixed or getting something uh, emailed, I mean, email, email answered. So it's a wonderful quiet time. And um, I wanna just mention here the kind of going back to the idea of layers. I think that the color that cap captivated me there by that electric stovetop heating up water, um, the color idea that I saw was and, and, and that was made possible was probably related to Mark Rothko. And it's these Mark Rothko paintings that are really dark, but the darks, the darks and even the blacks, they never lose color vibrancy. And this is uh, 
a painting or I saw a painting quite similar to this in 2008 at a exhibit in Rome when I was studying there at Tyler School of Art. And it's through this looking at artists that uh, I think that informs the way uh, that I can see or the types of color uh, that I can create in a work. They're completely founded on these other artists' vision. As I was making this painting in the quiet about 11.30 or 12, one of my sons, Sole, uh, surprised me coming around the dark corner and he couldn't sleep. So I um, did what any uh, dad would do. I uh, sat him down right in front of this um, stove and I went to the refrigerator and got some milk and made him some toast. And there uh, to try to set his mind at ease and put him to, to rest, we read a favorite of ours called The Night Kitchen. I'm sure a lot of you are people are familiar with this book and have read it many times. It's a I see in my cupboard uh, for a lot of these paintings. And I also love the rhythm of rest that's in, in this book. I think uh, one of the key lines is milk in the batter, milk in the batter. We bake cake and nothing's the matter. Sets your mind at rest. And it's also playful. That's another idea of uh, reality of rest. When you're at rest, you can be playful. And you don't have to do things for a constructive reason, but I think that's the way a lot of uh, wonderful art gets made. Right. You know, Benny, it's it's wonderful that you share this, this Maurice Sendak image here too, because uh, when I look at these these paintings, even though they are rather small when you're in front of them, they have sort of a uh, sort of a, a scale that feels like like uh, you're kind of in a city, mm. and the and the uh, the tabletop elements are are buildings, the drawers are are part of the city. It's uh, yeah, it's a nice. I like that observation. Nice I see them often as uh, buildings or maybe as characters on a landscape. That's right. absolutely cool. Um, after, uh, after Sole went off to sleep, I continued to complete this painting. And let's see what's, okay. And I just have another quote I'd like to read now. Um, all these paintings, that, the paintings I've showed so far were all done in my kitchen and by either taking a step forward or a step back, moving to the left or to the right. And it reminds me of a quote, words of the French post-impressionist painter, Paul Cezanne. He says, here on the river's verge, I could be busy for months without changing my place, simply leaning a little more to the left or to the right. I, I really think about these works as that's literally what I've been doing for the last several months is just moving a little to the left, a little to the right. And um, there's uh, endless things to observe and kind of wonders to behold. There's the um, stove top. It's still there on the left. And one thing about this painting that struck me as I was doing it is in real life, the, uh, these are bananas and parsley on the far right. And I think in real life, that's, uh, that has, has such a abrupt feeling, bananas and parsley. But in a painting, it's just a, a wonder of the visual relationships between the two. Now, if you see up here in the upper left, that little candlestick, and this is a cutout in my kitchen, a, a little cutout window going on into the next room. And in the next room is uh, this, this wood room, what we call it. It's got wood walls and here's a plant and this is called Sunday afternoon. And this is Sabrina taking a afternoon rest. And those same plants in that same room were used uh, from that same angle actually to make this uh, painting that I call Boy with Plant. 
And this is of my son, my other son, Palouse. And you see in that same room, and this is again with, you can see those, that uh, same plant hovering over the edge of this chair is iced coffee. Uh, I was trying to, I wanted to paint Sabrina and I uh, made her an iced coffee and I, I was trying to figure out what pose to have her in or what she should be doing. And I asked if she had any ideas. And this is her idea, which I instantly found charming, uh, funny, funny, I think. Uh, to me, there's a certain humor in this look, and uh, it's rather, uh, yeah, rather charming to me. You can't make the iced coffee as an inducement to pose and then ask someone to pose in a way that doesn't involve <laughs> drinking the coffee. That's right. That, that's right. And that, that reminds me that uh, the previous painting of my son, Palouse, anytime my kids pose for me, which they really don't like to do, they always have some kind of award. Uh, some kind of payment, uh, usually chocolate or some kind of candy. Of course. <laughs> and Sabrina needs the same. Iced coffee was hers. Naturally. Um, while these paintings were all being made, I was also making a lot of drawings. And um, this is Sabrina reading and Sole tucked into that same, or tucked into the chair that Sabrina was resting in earlier. And this is rather a humorous one, I feel like. Uh, Palouse, my boy, boy Palouse, taking a chomp of an apple sitting on the kitchen countertop. Now these paintings that I've showed you, shown you so far were all done from life. But at the same time I was doing paintings in my studio, uh, sorry, drawings in my studio, done in a different manner. And this is one called Coffee Pourer. And I wanna to return to this idea of what, what all goes into a drawing. And I, I don't know exactly what this kind of drawing means or I, could, I couldn't describe why I did it, but it, it arrived into my life, so to speak, in, a, in my sketchbook uh, one day. And um, I have some things that I wanna be you know, clear that I'm gonna show you some references or some things related, images related to the painting, but none of these were things that I used, uh, oh, it, actually, except for the wallpaper, were things that I used consciously, but they just hover there, I think, in the history of what I've looked at. Um, a key one, I've looked at these paintings for several years and marveled at them. This is Vermeer. And what I love here is the attention the concentration of the eyes to the hand. And um, this to me seems like it's really the center of what having any energy in life or any power to do things is about. It's about this moment of looking, uh, concentrating and achieving something. So uh, I like this as the core of what I'm thinking about for this last, or for this big drawing. And um, another thing that I realize has gone into this work is my studies of Piero della Francesca. And the middle, uh, the left is a fresco of Mary Magdalene. And on the, in the center is a drawing I made. And this was several years ago in 2014. And then a color study made to the right. And I think what struck me in this painting was the amount of solidity and power and just human vitality and health that was in that it's that's in this this figure of mary and i i think what what i uh gained from it is that that's really conveyed by means of simplicity of form and a kind of grand scale of things so this figure is permanent permanent and strong and uh, there, there's, uh, this is all from, mostly from memory or from imagination. And there's alterations in the figure that I've done intentionally, like these slightly larger feet that give it that anchoring quality, uh, a strength and connection to the ground of uh, a feeling of permanence.
let's see, I'm trying to go to the next slide. And, you know, I've looked a lot at Matisse and at Rich, Richard Diebenkorn. And I thought it was interesting how now looking back uh, at this Diebenkorn painting, how similar it is in the division of space. There's a central shadow here, a, a darker central figure. That's like the figure of Sabrina. There's a patterned wall and there's a cut off here and a view into the landscape. Again, this I wasn't looking at Diebenkorn when I did this, but I have a feeling that the, my history with looking made uh, Diebenkorn probably made its, his way into here. Another thing at the moment, at the time when I was making this that made its way into the work was a movie that I uh, like a lot, Phantom Thread. And in that, uh, in their dining room where they have breakfast, there's this stunning wallpaper that you can see there on the far left, a little glimpse of it. And I decided to put that into the work. And it also reminded me of Botticelli's Primavera where there's an orange garden that she's in, the central figure. And this, this wallpaper was, I guess, designed by William Morris. And this is an example of that, or a, a detail of that wallpaper. So you can see it there in my kitchen that I made up. And I also want to take note that there's this uh, table here that's going to make its way into my next painting. And this whole um, kitchen is, that this figures in is the kitchen from my last show window room. And this is that room from the window room show. And this is a detail of a drawing I'll show you in full in a moment. But here's the table top. And the figure would have been standing right here in from the last drawing. I want to tell you all a little bit or tell you just kind of indicate what went into the making of this table. Here's a uh, full view of the drawing. And this is my window room painting set into the landscape of Idaho from where I grew up. I think I probably arrived at the idea that you could just set a room in a landscape and open up a wall uh, from Giotto. I like how you can see this uh, private and intimate moment uh, from this distance and you can also see the exterior. Here's the drawing in my studio here in Texas. And on the left are three drawings. And in those drawings, I was working out how to play with perspective. <clears throat> At the same time that I was making these drawings, I was also teaching drawing and one thing that I uh, teach in drawing, I need to teach perspective, but I also need to teach that perspective is not the law. There's no law that says perspective has to be adhered to. And in fact, when perspective, linear perspective is totally adhered to, it produces the effect that the viewer looking at the painting is frozen in space. And we as humans aren't frozen in space. So by, um, I think that perspective needs to be loosened up a bit so that it feels more lifelike. This is a drawing demonstration for a class that I, I think on this demo, I got a little carried away and uh, worked, worked at after hours and continued because I was just interested in what I was doing uh, beyond the class. And right. you'll notice the uh, uh, shifts of perspective where you see the bottom of this uh, vase flat as if you're looking at the tabletop eye to eye and the rim, you're looking down into it. And here uh, you see this box and you look over the edge. You, it's as if you stood up and walked over to this box and looked over the edge and down into this vessel sitting on the tabletop. Now, these ideas of loosening up or humanizing perspective of course, uh, came from Cezanne. And Cezanne is uh, remarkable for how playful he was with perspective and he never 
was uh, felt like he was enslaved to it. And the effect is that his drawings, his paintings, feel more like life than if they had um, obeyed a strict perspectival rule. Here's a close up of ways in which I'm working out this tabletop idea. And on this far right one, you'll note that the bowl of oranges you can see down into it, whereas the vase that's right next to it, you can't see into it. You're further back looking at it. So it's moving around and um, let's see what's next here. So this is a close up of that tabletop in the actual drawing that's in the show. And this is what I arrived at with an inclusion added of dandelions to uh, in a vase to imply spring. So um, yeah, and this is my last uh, slide. Um, and these, these drawings, the two drawings are larger. All the paintings in the show are smaller. Uh, this drawing is 60 inches tall by 48 inches wide. And I, I think that, you know, I could look at this drawing and say, for this show that I made, I was inside this kitchen and we were all, I think, more at home this year. And uh, now that this show is done and this body of work is made, my plan is to simply walk right out of that kitchen and out into the landscape. And that's what I plan to do this summer is go paint in Idaho in the landscape. Great, fantastic, wonderful, Benny. Uh, let's see, that, that was really fantastic. Should we bring Sarah back in to this discussion? Um, uh, we're at uh, 627 right now, but I think we can afford to go over time a little bit. I think we've got a lot going on here. Let's see. Yeah, welcome back, Sarah. Thank you. You know, it's interesting uh, because I remember that show where Benny and I were both showing and we both had uh, infants. I think he had twins. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we were both in the gallery with our partners juggling our, our children. <laughs> And uh, a little bit shell shocked. <laughs> and I remember his kitchen pieces. Uh, but what's interesting is now we're both also finding a way in our own work to either slow or stop time, find a way to meditate and focus on the moment and or place in both of our works. So uh, even though we're working very differently, uh, there is so much of that quality in both of, in all the both exhibitions yeah that's right i uh <clears throat> i was i must say with uh, brand new twins at that point i was much more sleep deprived than i am now and uh but still uh through, you know just finding that that time to look and focus in in the way we do when we're making work how uh, essential that is to making, or to, to feeling well as a human. Yeah. I think you have a question there. Oh, Benny, yes. Uh, Catherine Ace, another one of our gallery artists. Hello, Catherine, uh, is asking of Benny, have you studied perspective with vertical moving vanishing points? Like in Pompeii, are you bending perspective to direct and encourage emotions? Uh, Catherine, that's a great question. and. Actually, I, I've just proposed a project to study the perspective in Pompeii. So Wonderful. we're thinking along the same lines for sure. I, I, was, I had plans to do that last summer and it got canceled. Um, but yes, bending perspective to direct and encourage emotions, absolutely. And I think mostly in terms of it as creating either intimacy or distance. So by looking down on something, you're right there with it. You're close to it. But by uh, looking at the, the profile of something, you're far back and at a distance. So I think the, the emotion, Catherine, of the feeling of distance and with it freedom or intimacy and with it closeness. You know, I was curious, Benny, actually, 
something you didn't mention, but it's clearly a huge factor uh, in your paintings and drawings is light because you've got these deep shadows and these little halos of light or stark contrast of your shadows and then objects that are surrounded by light or completely hidden by shadow. Um, do you actually have that kind of contrast? Like, you know, if you're working at night, is it quite dark with just that light under the stove on? And how does that affect you actually seeing your painting while you're working? Yeah, um, and I have a I have a question about your the light you're using, but um, I'll, I'll try to. You know, when I'm painting those night ones, I can't see anything. It's so dark, and it's yeah. <laughs> so I try to flip the lights on a little bit while I'm working to see what I'm doing. But they are really that that stark and contrasty, mm -hmm. and you know the um, the light is. Obviously, yeah, key to the whole work. It's the center mm -hmm. centerpiece of the whole work. They, um, there, the light is the uh, one of the key muses of the of the work for sure. And I, it, I was, it kind of, yeah, sorry, I have to interject. It just reminded me of that idea of working by candlelight, where you no longer or looking at a piece by candlelight, where it's so dim that you no longer really see color, but you see value. So it's sort of a way to check painterly way to check oneself to see if you're getting those values right and if it's reading. So uh, so just curious to think about you working that way in the dark. Yeah. Yeah and I have that I have a palette already ahead of time thought thought out with you mm -hmm. know a certain kind of brown and I kind of know how they'll react. So I can't see them at night but I kind of know by faith what they're doing and and that they'll arrive somewhere in the vicinity in the daylight. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering though, what um, it's interesting that sometimes your light is like reversed, like the object that you'd expect to be dark is with white mm -hmm. pencil. And then sometimes like uh, you're drawing in a way that is not dependent on chiaroscuro or light and shadow. Right. Tones. Uh, any thoughts there on are you thinking mostly about line and gesture and the movement of that line rather than light and shadow? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, light is a lot more about um, spatial representation. So less of that shadow and how it falls on something or how it creates a shape and more about objects being in front or in back of something. So light for me is a lot more about about space yeah. than it is about tone than actual light. And I am focused on line and gesture that mark the ink on the surface of the paper. And so it's interesting because light has become the color of the ink versus the color of the paper. Or sometimes there isn't a lot of contrast there. Uh, density of ink, density of marks versus the surface of the paper, which I've hand dyed to get the texture and color. Um, so I'm working with it and it does reverse when I use white ink versus a dark ink. And even though I'm a printmaker and I'm used to reversing things horizontally, I don't actually worry too much about the color of the ink reversing things. And it's more um, specifically the contrast and relationship of shapes and gesture rather than whether it's dark or light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, The even the, the light ones, they don't look to me like a negative image. They just look like a substantial thing, a real thing, even though right. they don't obey uh, rules of light and shadow or something. I, I think it's because that's my mental process. And uh, and so if I thought about it in terms of light and had to reverse reverse it for the white being the bright and the paper being the dark, then it would read like that. But I, def I don't approach it that way. You're correct. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, let's see, uh, Mackenzie is asking uh, of Benny, I believe, but uh, but please both feel free to answer this. Uh, 
When did you come to discover your love for color and or color theory? Go for it, Benny. Um, color is the same thing as light. And uh, I lived in Portland for several years and there wasn't enough light for me. And uh, I, love, I love light and uh, it makes me feel good to have a lot of light and uh, color relationships seem to me like um, the substance of, of life. The, uh, you know, light is really, light and color, light, light is what animates everything in our world. Um, the sun makes plants grow and uh, we, we, eat, we eat those plants or those animals to have our energy and vital, vitality. And so always, uh, Mackenzie, it's always been there and and as since I started being a painter, it was always there with a, a increased increased level of awareness, and so that would have been uh, twenty years ago or so. Great answer. Um, it's definitely uh, directed at Benny, but. Um, it's just interesting to hear you say that because um, color has never been one of the factors in my work. So ironically, my show is called Blue, which is a color, but uh, my development as an artist was hugely based on my development as a printmaker, specifically etchings. And I worked in black and white for years and years and that's still my grounding point. So my focus is on line and mark. Um, and so I'm still in very much in many ways working in black and white, even as I work in blue and blue or something like that. Um, I just noticed a question from Kathy Nace about our experience of time changing over the last year or has it? Uh, and I was curious if if that's been a factor for you, Benny, or what you think about that? Um, I don't. I don't know for sure, and uh, I think that my practice as a painter, in a sense, has stayed just the same as it always has been. Mm -hmm. um, no shift. Um, so related to the work, I don't think this has caused much of a change in my. A painting practice kind of interestingly um, but I suppose it's in the non-painting life that my sense of time has gotten completely derailed how about you what do you think Sarah um actually really similarly uh, because um my husband's a mountain guide and all guiding was off as of March 17th and they just had to cancel everything so uh, I've actually had more time to work because he's done the bulk of the childcare and homeschooling uh, or remote schooling. And so I actually work most of the week, 8.30 to five. And that's expanded my ability to work and spend time in the studio. So that has continued and all the projects I had, most of my projects are long-term. So you know, I'm working on a book. They take two to three years sometimes, frequently. And even this show, you know, while I wasn't physically working on it for over a year, um, it's still in my cognizance. It's still in my mind. It's something I'm factoring in, factoring in thinking about how am I going to work on that and what am I working on? And so... Um, so this year didn't really change a lot in my in my actual working process and in terms of my sense of time there. But at home, uh, it was very fast and very slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. And tested my patience. Hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> patience. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty universal experience, I think. I, I think so. Yeah, and so we both have the personal and the the universal. 
Yes. <laughs> Certainly. Well, uh, it looks like uh, we're about 10 minutes over our stated time. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Does uh, anyone have anything they'd like to say before we, uh, we sort of wrap up here for the evening? Um, well, I'm, I'm missing not being there with both of you, but it's, it's been a pleasure and I'm really honored to have a show with Benny again. Um, since we have the privilege of having two months for this show, I am going to be all come down uh, at the very beginning of May. I'll let you know how it looks, Benny. Yeah, please do. Definitely. And the feeling is mutual and um, getting to show with you again. And um, also um, just wanted to say thanks to whoever showed up to listen, listen in. I've got yeah. family and friends and some colleagues, I think. So absolutely I appreciate it. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, Benny and Sarah's shows will be up uh, through May 29th. So a good solid two months. Um, if you are in the Portland area, uh, you can get in touch to make an appointment uh, to view. Uh, also, all the works will be available to view online too. And there are many ways to do that. We'll be putting together some videos and exhibition views for everyone to see. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Happy first Thursday. Thank you, Wilder and Charles. Thank you.